Now we're on to lecture four. Now we want to apply standard enthalpies to uh, chemical systems as we were discussing in the previous lecture. So let's consider the reaction where we have propane uh, gas reacting with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide gas and water. Now, if we have the enthalpies of enthalpy change, a standard enthalpy change of formation of the components of this reaction, that is the enthalpy change, the standard enthalpy change of formation for propane gas, um, standard enthalpy change for oxygen gas, standard enthalpy change for water and for carbon dioxide, then we are able, we will be able to um, calculate the standard enthalpy change for this reaction. Now, there are a number of ways to do this. Um, and I'll show you the easiest, well, well what I think is the easiest method, or uh, the most straightforward method rather, is to consider the sum of the enthalpy change of um, the products minus the sum of the enthalpy change of the reactants. Of course, you have to give consideration to the stoichiometric coefficients. Why is that? Well, if you look at the standard enthalpy of formation data, you realize that these are molar values, meaning that the values given are for one mole. And as, as we discussed in the previous lecture, uh, standard enthalpy of formation speaks to the um, enthalpy change when a mole of a substance is formed from its elements in their uh, reference states. So for this reaction, given the data, we are able to calculate the enthalpy change, uh, the standard enthalpy change rather for the reaction as shown here. And the value that we have is minus... Um, 200 minus 2219.8 kilojoules. Now, if you look at the value for oxygen, the standard enthalpy change of formation for oxygen gas, you realize that it is zero. And this is because uh, oxygen, oxygen is O2 basically, is how oxygen exists. Naturally, this is its reference state. Oxygen generally exists as a diatomic uh, gas. So there is no change because if you think back, if you think back to what I said a few, uh, a few minutes ago, enthalpy change of formation is the energy change when one mole of a substance is formed from its um, elements in their reference state. Oxygen's reference state is O2 gas. So there is no change in going from O2 gas to O2 gas. And so the enthalpy change of formation for oxygen gas is zero. Uh, so here we have, you know, and just back to our calculation. So you see that we are, we have, you know, we were successful in calculating the standard enthalpy change for the combustion of one mole of uh, propane gas. Uh, by just considering the enthalpies of formation, some of the enthalpies of formation of the products, and to take away from that the sum of the enthalpies of formation, um, some of the enthalpy changes of formation for the, the reactants, of course, giving consideration to the, um, the stoichiometric coefficients. Alternatively, you could go via basically a vector type method, a vector like method as shown here on the on the right hand side of our slide. Uh, this is the same thing as using the enthalpy of formations and saying products minus reactants, but uh, it, it involves a little bit more, and that's something you can also think about. Now, it is not magic that the enthalpies of formation can be used in this way. This, base, this usefulness comes simply from the fact that, um, um, that we have set up a, a relative scale of enthalpy in the way we have defined enthalpy change of formation. And so we have, in effect, um, referred all reactants and products to the same zero, if you think about it. You can also make use of standard enthalpies of formation in assessing stability of of, um, of, of compounds. So let's say you have cis-2-butene and trans-2-butene and you want to discuss which is more stable. Now, of course, in chemistry, in, in science, 
lower energy generally means greater stability, right? Lower the energy, the greater the stability. Now, if you try to compare both um, cis-2-butene and trans-2-butene to the st their um, starting materials, which will be carbon and hydrogen, what you realize, um, carbon and hydrogen gas, of course, what you realize is that trans-2-butene is of a lower enthalpy value than cis-2-butene, right? And even if you just try to compare cis-2-butene to trans-2-butene, you realize that the trans-isomer is of lower um, um, energy than the cis isomer and this is mainly because uh, in the cis isomer um, there is steric interactions repulsive steric interactions between the methyl groups which are on the same which are in the same plane rather and so you can see clearly here that you could make use of enthalpy data in assessing stability of compounds now there are other things you could do. You could use the enthalpy change for a process in another way. So let's say, for example, somebody asks you or you're asked to consider a molecule like butane or even benzene, right? And to make an assessment of the stability or the presence of stabilizing or destabilizing effects in these systems. For example, the enthalpy, the standard enthalpy change of formation of butane as calculated from um, standard enthalpy change of formation of um, its reacting species compared to um, butane itself gave a value, an experimental value of minus 126 kilojoules per mole. For benzene, this value is um, positive 82.9 kilojoules per mole. Now, we are going to look at the idea of actually comparing experimental enthalpy change of formation to a more theoretical um, um, type value in, uh, in making an assessment or let's say, and, and, by, and, and, you know, and to use that idea to make an assessment of the stability of the compound in consideration. And, and I'm just going to show you exactly how you could do such a thing. And just to give you a heads up, we can use bond dissociation enthalpies. But what are bond dissociation enthalpies though? Now bond dissociation enthalpy, for example, of a molecule, a hypothetical molecule AB, is defined essentially as the enthalpy of this reaction given here. And if you look at that reaction, you'll realize that, oh, it is basically the enthalpy change when one mole of a certain type of bonds are broken. Um, of course, the compound must be in the gaseous phase for this to apply. Uh, if you look at this react, this second reaction, you have uh, methane being converted to gaseous carbon and gaseous hydrogen atoms. The carbon-hydrogen bond enthalpy, right? The carbon-hydrogen bond enthalpy here would, of course, be one-fourth of the energy change of this reaction. How is that so? Why is that so? Well, there are four carbon-hydrogen bonds in methane. And if you get an energy change for this reaction, which is, the, which is, which is a reaction involved the, involving the breaking of all four bonds, let's say you get a value of 100 kilojoules. I'm just putting a number out there. You get a value for this second reaction of 100 kilojoules. And this 100 kilojoules was the energy required to break all four carbon-hydrogen bonds. Now, clearly, the energy required to break one of those bonds is on average 25 kilojoules, right? 25 kilojoules. And so the average bond dissociation enthalpy, if the, for this process, the energy change is 100 kilojoules, will be 25 uh, kilojoules. Let's look at another example, right? We have here propane, right, being converted to propene gas. So propane gas being converted to propene gas. So what we have done here is basically to break two of the carbon-hydrogen bonds. 
And if we break two carbon hydrogen bonds and we measure the energy change of the process, then clearly the energy required to break one of those will be half of the what of the measured value. Okay. Now, this is interesting. This is interesting because the fact that we basically have the value indicates to us that what we have is an average bond dissociation enthalpy and not an absolute value. It's an average value. All right? Now, this brings about a little bit of a problem. Not exactly a problem, but it brings about a little bit of inaccuracy. That is, bond dissociation enthalpy values are normally, um, you know, about 90% accurate, plus or minus 10%. That's where their accuracy lies. Okay? Because not all carbon-hydrogen bonds are the same. A hydrogen, a carbon-hydrogen bond, where the carbon in consideration is attached by a single bond to another carbon versus one where that carbon, the carbon in question, is attached to another carbon by a double bond, will have a different bond hydro carbon hydrogen bond dissociation enthalpy. And so the values that we use, these bond dissociation enthalpy values, are really average bond dissociation enthalpy values. Now, in using bond dissociation enthalpy data for calculating the enthalpy um, change of formation, there are some things that we have to be um, mindful of. Now, bond dissociation enthalpy. For example, if you have a hypothetical, if you have a hypothetical molecule AB in the gaseous phase, when that molecule, when that bond breaks between A and B to give gaseous A atoms and B atoms, then that enthalpy of reaction is the bond dissociation enthalpy. Now, the reverse reaction has the same numerical um, value of enthalpy change, but it has the opposite sign. So the bond formation, what we're saying is that bond formation and bond dissociation enthalpy values are of the same magnitude, but they have opposite signs. That is, Bond formation is exothermic, as seen in the second equation here in, in blue, whereas bond dissociation is an endothermic process. Also, we should note that the definition specifies that the substances must be in the gaseous phase. Now, the value of enthalpy, standard enthalpy change of formation, estimated from bond dissociation data, can then be compared to the value determined experimentally. That is using data found in tables to basically um, give an idea of the presence of stabilizing or special destabilizing effects in molecules. For example, the standard enthalpy of for enthalpy change of formation of N-butane, N just simply means that it's a straight chain, um, from tables can be calculated or when calculated is minus 126 kilojoules per mole. Now, we want to use bond dissociation enthalpy data to calculate the enthalpy of formation of N-butane and to compare what we calculate to this value. Now, how can we do this? Now, there are more than one ways, <clears throat> but we are going to go for a more structured method first and then to point out the vector method, which is seen here on the right-hand side. Um, or what we call the energy cycle method. <clears throat> now, first of all, the enthalpy of the reaction, the overall enthalpy of reaction of the um, of um, we, we, for the formation of N-butene is given by this first e first equation, where you have four moles of graphite reacting with five moles of hydrogen gas, right, to produce one mole one mole of N butane in the gaseous phase. Of course, graphite, graphite is naturally uh, a solid, whereas hydrogen exists as a diatomic molecule and, and, uh, and it's a gas, of course. And remember, enthalpy of formation, the definition says it's when one mole of a substance is formed from its, um, its elements um, in their reference states, all right? And the reference state for hydrogen gas, for hydrogen, is that it's a diatomic molecule and it's gaseous. And for graphite, it's a solid. 
Now, how do we make use of bond dissociation enthalpy data? The first thing you have to understand is that all chemical reactions, all chemical reactions can be classified as either exothermic or endothermic. All right, either exothermic or endothermic. Now, another statement that I will make now might sound contradictory. I'm going to say that all, all chemical reactions are also are also exothermic at the same time that they are endothermic. In other words, all chemical reactions are both exothermic and endothermic at the same time. However, it is a process that is more dominant that will tell what the what 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 the overall reaction is. That is, during a chemical reaction, two processes are occurring simultaneously: bond formation and bond breaking. Bond breaking occurs in the reactants, whereas bond formation occurs in the products. Bond Breaking is an endothermic process, right? It requires energy. Whereas bond formation is an exothermic process. That is, energy is released. The thing is, let's say more energy, right? In an, hypothet in a, in an hypothetical reaction, let's say more energy is released than that is absorbed. If more energy is released in this hypothetical reaction, then what you find is that the reaction is net exothermic, right? It's, it's um, synonymous to making 10 steps forward and 15 steps backwards, right? Then the net movement is backwards by 5 steps. So that, that is, that's the same, the, the situation is the same with chemical reactions. So in this case, where we're looking at the formation, we're trying to use bond dissociation enthalpy data to uh, calculate the enthalpy of formation, the standard enthalpy of formation of N-butene. We can divide our calculations into two steps, exothermic process and an endothermic process. Let's look at the exothermic process first. <coughs> now, right, for the exothermic process, we have to look at the number of bonds being formed and the different uh, and, and what are these type of bonds that are being formed in N-butene. For example, in N-butene, we know that there are three carbon-carbon single bonds. And if you should draw the structure of N-butene, you'll see that there are three carbon-to-carbon -carbon single bonds. So if we know the amount of energy required to break such a bond, then all we have to do is to invert the sign on this number. Once we invert the sign on this number, then it, it, it basically becomes the bond formation um, enthalpy. And so the energy released when one carbon-carbon bond is formed is minus 348 kilojoules. So if we multiply that minus 348 kilojoules by 3, then we get the total amount of energy released when um, the carbon-carbon bonds of N-butene are formed. Also, in N-butene, we have 10 carbon-hydrogen bonds being formed. Now, the energy released during the formation of one carbon-hydrogen bond is minus 412 kilojoules. So, if we multiply that value by 10, then we get the total amount of energy released as a result of the formation of carbon-hydrogen bonds in N-butene. And hence, at the end of the day, if we consider the amount of energy released during the formation of the carbon-carbon bonds and also during the formation of all the carbon-hydrogen bonds, then we realize that the total energy released for the formation are for the formation of the bonds in N-butene is minus 5,164 kilojoules. That's the amount of energy released during the reaction. Of course, like we said, the reaction can be um, imagined to occur in, to, to involve two processes, exothermic process and an endothermic process. Now let's look at the endothermic process. This is the amount of energy absorbed. Now, one of the things we have to remember, as we stated on the previous slide, is that 
our reacting species must be in the gaseous phase. Now, graphite is a solid, so we have to convert graphite to a vapor. All right? Also, hydrogen is a diatomic molecule, and so we have to convert our hydrogen to gaseous atoms. Now, for the conversion, for the sublimation of one mole of graphite, the, the, the energy required is 716 kilojoules. And seeing that we need four moles of graphite, right, for the, for, 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 for the formation of N-butene, and then we have to multiply 716 uh, kilojoules by four to get the total amount of energy required to convert all the solid graphite to vapor. And that value is 2,864 kilojoules. Now we have to consider the hydrogen molecules. We need to break the bonds in 5 moles of hydrogen gas. To do this, the energy per mole is 436. Energy required to break 1 mole of hydrogen bonds is 436 um, kilojoules. So we have to multiply that by 5 such that we get 10 moles of hydrogen atoms, gaseous, of course. The total energy absorbed to do that is 2,180 kilojoules. Now, when we sum, when we sum all the energy, um, you know, the, or when we compare the energy, the energies absorbed, or the energy absorbed to that of the energy released, then we get a value of minus 120 kilojoules. So the, 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 the enthalpy, standard enthalpy change of formation of N-butene as calculated using bond dissociation enthalpy data is minus 120 kilojoules. And remember we did this. We looked at the fact that chemical reactions, all chemical reactions are both endothermic, sorry, endothermic and exothermic at the same time. Okay? Exothermic Right? The exothermic aspect is concerned with the formation of bonds in the product, whereas the endothermic aspect is concerned with the breaking of bonds in the reactants. And all you have to do is to calculate the amount of energy released and the amount of energy absorbed, and you can compare them. And that will give you the net um, direction of energy flow, endo or exo. And also you will get the you know, by summing those numbers, you will get the magnitude. And in this case, we got a value of minus 120 kilojoules, telling us that formation of n is an exothermic process and requires 120 kilojoules. Now, this is important because all we have to do now is just to compare the calculated value, which is minus 120, to the experimental value, right? The experimental enthalpy change of formation value which is minus 126 kilojoules. Now, given the error in bond dissociation enthalpy data, which is about 10%, we can see that the calculated and experimental values are basically identical, seeing that the error in the, error in the bond dissociation enthalpy data is about 10%. So they are identical, and from this you can conclude that there are no special destabilizing or stabilizing effects present in N-butene molecules. And this basically is how we use bond dissociation um, enthalpy data uh, to speak about stability of compound. When we compare, of course, you have to compare that to experimental and also um, to calculate the um, enthalpy change for a reaction. Now, that, this is, you know, this is something uh, very, very useful. Now, standard enthalpies of combustion. Now, standard enthalpy of combustion of a fuel, uh, um, you know, of fuels are called the calorific value or, uh, you know, specific enthalpy of the fuel. Now, and there are various units that, you know, have been used. For example, the calorie and one calorie is equal to um, four 0.184 uh, joules. Also, there, there are various various methods, and these are just some examples of um, energy values of various fuels. For example, hydrogen, you know, it has a high um, energy value per mole, minus 286 kilojoules per mole, and even per gram, it's, it's 142 kilojoules per gram, really high um, 
amount of energy, a significant amount of energy um, uh, per gram. You know, but of course, hydrogen is explosive, and so its application is somewhat limited. But nowadays, you know, more experimentation is going into the use of um, hydrogen as a fuel. So these are just some, you know, additional information. Right, and the idea of nutrition is calorie that one nutrition is calories equal to one thousand calories, which is four thousand one hundred eighty four joules. So the nutrition, the, the you know, the nutrition is calorie as given on the food labels is actually um, off by a factor of a thousand. All right, and these are just some energy values for different foods. For example, digestible carbohydrates is about 17 kilojoules per gram, whereas protein is about also 17 kilojoules per gram, interestingly. You know, so this, this is just some extra uh, reading information that the class can, can make use of.